Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Mary Todd, and I am the membership specialist here at KOSU. Uh, this is the third event that we've hosted as part of this series called Inside KOSU. Uh, in the past, we've had conversations and Q&As with KOSU's agricultural and rural issues reporter, Seth Bodine. Um, we also uh, hosted one with state impact health reporter, Catherine Sweeney. And tonight we are very excited to host this discussion with state impacts education reporter, Robbie Korth. Uh, Robbie has been with state impact uh, Oklahoma since October of 2019. Um, he's originally from Ardmore, Oklahoma, and he also grew up in Fayetteville, Arkansas. He lives in Oklahoma City with his wife and his dog, Willa. Um, some housekeeping announcements. Um, everybody is on mute. Um, if you have any questions throughout this discussion, you can put them in the Q&A box, which is at the bottom of the screen. Um, if you could please use the Q&A box to submit questions and leave the chat box open for uh, just general discussion. Um, KOSU is also going to be um, adding links to stories and resources in the chat box throughout this discussion. So if you put your question in the chat box, it will likely be lost there. Um, we are going to be monitoring both. So we have made it part of our mission to answer every question um, as part of tonight's event. Um, so it's very exciting to have Robbie here tonight because there's a lot of education news happening in Oklahoma right now. Um, so without further delay, I'm gonna hand over the screen to our special projects reporter, uh, Kately Mills and Robbie Korth. Hey, Marion. Okay, cool. So we can go ahead and get started. Um, let's kick it off with our first topic which is spring assessment tests. Uh, Robbie, you recently did a piece discussing uh, this coming, uh, the spring ass assessments coming back after a year of it being off, I guess is what you would say. For starters, what is the purpose of giving a standardized test uh, this year or any year? Um, and can you tell us about your trip to Calumet where that piece was located and what you learned there? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Kately. Thanks for, uh doing this tonight and having me on, um, first of all. So yeah, to start, spring assessment tests are basically, they're, they're mandated by federal law. They happen every spring, hence the name. Um, and basically what, what school districts and, and really states are trying to do is measure how students are doing in specific topics. So um, federal law dictates like in certain grades, you need to be assessed for how well you can read or how well you can do math. Um, so basically what the state is trying to do is say, here's like, here's um, how our th third graders are doing on reading, for example, um, and, and see if there's progress, you know, or, or problems over the course of the year. And uh, some of these tests are very, are, are high stakes. Like for example, that third grade reading test I mentioned, it's it's required for um, you to get a specific score to move on to fourth grade. Uh, and what about your trip to Calumet? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, so for that story I did a week or two ago, um, I went to Calumet because it's a very high performing rural school district in Canadian County, um, probably about 50 miles west of Oklahoma City. Um, so for that story, I went out there just to sort of talk to them about everything they're doing to prepare for the spring assessments this year and what they hope to get out of it. Um, I had actually gone to Calumet to do a story sort of prepping for spring assessments in early 2020, but that story was delayed just like the tests themselves because of COVID. Um, so it was kind of revisiting what, what, did, what did you all do to to get ready for tests last year, what do you do in a normal year? And then sort of, what are you doing to make sure you do well on the tests this year? Um, they weren't overly concerned with the tests. They weren't 
they, you know, they do well on them, but that's because they prioritize reading in general at Calumet Elementary School, I learned. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of, kind of what I did there. Very good. Um, I'll go to some questions about this exact topic. Uh, we'll start with the question from Brenda from OKC. She said, do teachers and other educators with boots on the ground actually ever have access to examine the results in any useful detail? Uh, so, um, yes, but, you know, the big, a big but there, they don't get them for a very long time. So by the time, it's like the middle of the summer by the time they get the results. And there's really not a whole lot you can do. I mean, so, you know, I, I mentioned, you know, if you don't pass the third grade reading test, for example, you're, you're not supposed to advance on to fourth grade. Well, there are a lot of caveats to that. There are, you know, various ways that, that um, kids can pass. Um, you can also request a waiver from taking these tests. So, um, you know, the, the bottom line is yes, that the boots on the ground do get the results each year. Um, but, uh, you know, they're not, they're not like a tool that most teachers or really very many teachers are going to be using to assess their kids. Okay. Um, and then we have another one about this topic from Anthony from Stillwater. Will there be an exemption? Uh, will there be an exception this year for the statewide third grade test due to COVID nineteen and its effect on the learning environment? So uh, yes and no. The tests are still happening, um, and they are uh, so. So third graders will take them, as with kids in every grade. Um, but again, another asterisk on this one: they're not supposed to count. So. Uh, each year in Oklahoma, every school is given a letter grade for how they perform on these tests, among some other things. Well, because this year was so weird, the Oklahoma State Board of Education is not going to be giving out a letter grade. Instead, what they're going to use this year's data as is as a sort of baseline benchmark for future years um, to see like if progress was made, if progress wasn't made. So uh, yeah, the, the short answer is no, there's, there's not an exception. The tests are still happening, but they, they're, not, they're not high stakes. Can you walk us back on like the background of that a little bit? Like when was it decided that they were going to do these tests whenever they didn't do it uh, in 2020? Yeah, so there was, a, there was a big push over the summer among education advocates and even some lawmakers in Oklahoma to ask for waivers for the tests in 2021. Um, but uh, then Education Secretary Betsy DeVos made it pretty clear in the fall that she wasn't going to grant any waivers. Um, so then when the Biden administration started up, well, there was some, some renewed hope in some states, not Oklahoma, but some states requested waivers from these tests because like I, I said earlier, they are federally mandated. Um, but Oklahoma uh, never made that request, but they did very early on in December say, hey, let's disentangle the tests from accountability. So we're still going to take them, but we're going to separate out um, you know, what, what the tests mean from the results. Very good. Okay, so let's move on next to the legislation portion. We've dubbed, we've dubbed it. Um, and so for everyone joining a little late, I just wanna say thanks again uh, for joining this edition of Inside KOSU. I'm Caitlin Mills, Special Projects Reporter for KOSU, and I'm here with State Impact Oklahoma Education Reporter, Robbie Korth. Uh, so I wanna turn now to talk about the American Rescue Plan, the federal government's latest economic stimulus bill. And to learn more about its impact on Oklahoma in terms of education. So to kick that off, uh, let's get a, let's get the uh, question from Joe from Watonga. Um, I heard that a lot of money authorized in the latest COVID federal bill will be for years in the future. Is that true? Yes, yes. Okay. Um, how is money allocated in this bill for education and how does this build on previous COVID related congressional bills? 
Okay, well, that's, that's, those are very good questions. So the most recent American Rescue Plan uh, uh, bill, legislation that was passed, provides $1.5 billion for education in Oklahoma, specifically for public schools. And the vast majority of that will be distributed to public schools over the next couple of years. Um, the money will actually be allocated you know, in chunks until 2023. So, um, and, one, and, and for context too, $1.5 billion is roughly half of what um, the state allocates out for uh, education each year. So, I mean, this is a huge amount of money. Uh, this is, it's, it's a lot and it's designed to pay for really everything that's, that's been affected by COVID. Um, the, the biggest portion is obviously for staff and faculty salaries, um, tax, local tax revenues and, and other sorts of uh, school district revenue sources are, have really been hurt by the pandemic. So um, the American Rescue Plan is designed to keep, keep school districts afloat in, and able to keep teachers and, and other staff members employed. But there are other things too that it's, that it's supposed to pay for like uh, you know, ventilation sort of improvements, um, efforts to ensure social distancing in classrooms. Um, really, really, there's just a ton of uses for this money um, that's going to be doled out over several years. So it'll be really interesting to see what school districts make of it. Um, they are definitely going to lose out on a lot of normal tax revenues over the next next uh, couple of years. So. Do we yet like know how it will be allocated, whether it's based on like the size of the school district or any information about that? Yeah, so it? basically it's allocated, this is a little wonky, but it's allocated through what's known as Title I. So uh, the number of students who are like, uh, who come from low income backgrounds are weighted more. Um, so, so districts with more low income students will get more money. Um, like Tulsa Public Schools, Oklahoma City Public Schools are, are two districts that will probably get a lot. Um, but I mean, there are a lot of rural districts that, that are majority low income as well. So all of those districts are sure to see more money. The State Department of Education actually gets a portion of that money and, and they have vowed to say like, okay, if your district maybe has, isn't gonna get as much because you don't have as many lower income students, but you're still struggling, we'll give you a little bit extra money as the state um, to sort of close that gap a little bit. Okay, very good. Uh, let's go now to House Bill 2078. Uh, okay. <laughs> that, that was a recent piece you did uh, tackling the redistribution of state funds to schools. Um, tell us the gist of what's happening with that House Bill and, and the conversations around that. Yeah, so, okay, this is a very this is a very complicated bill, House Bill 2078, but the simple, the simplified version is this. Um, essentially, every year, a school district is, is given a certain amount of money from the state's funding formula. And so the state's, Oklahoma state funding formula says, okay, a youth school district, you know, based on the number of students, and then they give different students different weights, like on income levels, and if they're English language learners, different sort of statuses. So they, they have these adjusted sort of um, enrollment counts. So what House Bill 2078, and, and so they take the previous three years, and they say, okay, whatever your highest enrollment is, that is the number we will use to determine how much money you get from this funding formula. House Bill 2078 will take that three year high and change it now. I mean, originally it was going to be like this year is what you get, but they've now, it's now been amended to where it's their two year high. Um, and, you know, whatever your high enrollment is in the last two years, that's what we'll use on the funding formula. It's an effort to um, do what, what Republican lawmakers and the governor say is are these students who are transferring between districts and getting double counted. Um, it's an effort to delete these sort of double countings. Um, public school advocates and, and superintendents and school boards just, just hate this because 
it makes it harder to predict what budgeting might look like for your school. Um, they, they argue that the, these averages are, are like looking at the three year high um, sort of guarantees that you, that you can go into a school year, you know, more or less knowing like what kind of support you're going to get from the state. And keep in mind in Oklahoma, state support is, is relatively low. I mean, we are the lowest among all of our neighbors. So yeah, that's, that's kind of that effort. It's, it's already passed the house it is now in the Senate where it will likely pass and it will probably be signed by the governor. Um, so yeah. Is there any validity in the point that lawmakers are making that there is a double counting going on? And if so, like, do we, do we know that? <laughs> well, I mean, yes, that, that there, this double counting is happening. If I am a student in Oklahoma City Public Schools, and I transfer to Edmond Public Schools. Um, Oklahoma City might use the previous year's number for the formula. They might use Edmond's number for this year, and I would be counted twice. Yes, that 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 does happen. Um, but what uh, what superintendents would argue is that's not really counting twice. That is counting. Um, that's counting for the number of students who who might be attending. Like it's. It's, it's a taking into account fluctuations over years um, and it's making, it's, it's providing a little bit of stability and funding in a state where we don't have a lot of stability and funding for our schools, if that makes, does that make sense? That helps me a little bit at least. <laughs> Hopefully it helped others as well. Um, so we have some questions submitted uh, about this topic. Um, this is from Dan from Bartlesville. Thanks for submitting. Uh, what is the outlook for public education funding from the state for the 2021-22 school year? Decrease, decreased level with 2021 or increase? Did it go up or down? Uh, well, we don't, it's not, the budget's not finalized for 21-22 yet, but all signs point to a decrease, but a modest one. Um, the state budget's outlook is actually looking better than we thought it would like last, late last year. Um, I think oil and gas revenues are, are doing better than anticipated. So um, as well as like consumer spending and payroll tax income and, and you know, various revenues for the state are, are, are doing better. They're not like doing great, obviously. Um, the entire, the economy of the United States is in a, is slumping, but uh, so long answer uh, summed up here. Yes. Slight decrease. <laughs> okay. Uh, and Robbie, yeah. something that will transition us, but I do need to ask, will this harm Epic in any way? So the, the authors of house bill 2078 argue yes that this will harm Epic because, and, and for those don't, who don't know, Epic Charter Schools is the largest school district in Oklahoma. It is largely a virtual charter school. It has about 60,000 students and, and people have flocked to it during the pandemic. Um, so the authors of House Bill 2078 say, okay, well, there's this, been this flocking but there's also been some backlash toward virtual education across the state. I mean, we've heard it from our governor who's, you know, said that virtual education doesn't work for most kids and called for in-person education wherever possible. We've, you know, heard it from all levels. Um, educators themselves have, have long said that virtual education doesn't stack up to in-person education. Um, so theoretically, the authors of House Bill 78, 2078 say this will, the who this will hurt the most is Epic because they will lose the most students. Um, I don't, I don't know if that's really true. That seems like pure speculation because on the one hand, uh, you know, we have many education advocates and, and, and politicians saying that uh, in, um, in-person schooling is better, but we don't seem to have a lot of parents and students saying that. And when they can make their own choice. I mean, I'm sure many will choose to, to stay with Epic. Very good. Uh, and then there was, there was a point that you also wanted to make that you thought was rather interesting. Um, 
do you want to make it or do you want me to say it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, what I basically, you know, so Epic has, for those of you don't, who don't know, Epic has had a lot of challenges. Um, they've been under criminal investigation uh, for several, a couple of years now. Um, they were recently fined by the State Department of Education for um, $11.2 million. They refused to pay back that $11.2 million. Um, after That was after a state auditor's report came out that said that uh, they had, had uh, partaken in some, you know, practices that, that weren't ideal as far as uh, hiring too many administrators and, and funneling too much money into the private company, private for-profit company that, that manages the school. Um, so, uh, but there was no, um, no bills were passed about uh, Epic after legislators, legislators sort of came out you know, after this auditor's report came out and said, we're gonna, we're gonna look at charter school reform, we're going to reform virtual charters, we're going to hold Epic accountable, and then they've passed nothing to do with virtual charter schools this session. Um, and, and they're not going to, it appears, so. Okay, uh, and so let's talk, let's talk about Epic, because a lot of the questions that we got were related to Epic. Yeah. Uh, and as someone who's covered it heavily, I think that you're yeah. the person to ask. <laughs> um, so you did a piece, the most recent piece that I saw you did on Epic was they missed the state deadline to pay um, $11.2 million. It was a fine handed down to the school in October. And I know you addressed it a little bit, but can you go back and tell us what happened in October and where we are now? Yeah, so basically the state, the auditor's report from the state auditor uh, said that Epic had hired too many people who were administrative, had administrative roles rather than teaching roles. And so there are rules about how much money a school can, can spend on administrative people versus instructors for, for instruction. And Epic, Epic uh, had too many people on staff who were not teaching. Uh, according to the state auditor, Epic denies this, by the way, and they say that that many of the people who the state auditor said were administrators were not actually administrators. But that's an argument for lawyers about what is an administrator. Um, so Epic uh, Epic owed eleven had pay, overpaid eleven point two million dollars. Um, Epic elected not to pay that back by the deadline, which was last week. Um, so we don't really know what is going to happen next. Um, the state could take legal action to compel them to pay the $11 million. What's probably going to happen is Epic will fight that figure in court because they don't believe they owe it um, and try to hold on to that money. Um, so yeah. Uh, and so we have another question about this sort of repayment situation. Um, mm -hmm. It's out of OKC, it was anonymous. What does the new OK State Board of Education funding decision, which I'm sure you'll talk about, mean for Epic's repayment plan? Does it affect how and when Epic should repay? What does this mean for school funding in general? Wow, so that is that is a very big question. Um, so for those of you who don't know, the Oklahoma State Board of Education last week uh, pushed out a ruling that said, uh, or, or passed a resolution after a closed session that uh, charter schools like Epic should be equally funded to public schools. Like basically all local and, and state tax revenues should be directed to charter schools and traditional public schools in, in the equivalent, essentially. So uh, previously charter schools couldn't do things like levy bonds or, or get local tax revenue. Well, under this ruling starting July 1st, they can. So how will this affect Epic? I mean, Epic is, will get a lot more money because the weight of their students in the funding formula will, will skyrocket um, because they will now be equal to any other student in the state. Right now their value is um, at about like two thirds. Most others like virtual schools get less money. Um, so yeah, 
uh, it's going to it's going to lead to a lot more money for Epic. Okay, and then we had a question um, about this as well from Becky from Bartlesville. The recent settlement with the Oklahoma State Board of Education and the Oklahoma Public Charter School Association is very alarming. Um, can you explain like what's going on there before we get to the question portion? The the recent is that you're talking about Epic? Yeah, that's the that's the yeah. same settlement. I mean, it doesn't directly have to do with Epic. Epic is just the school that's going to benefit the most. Okay, very good. I just wanted to make sure I'm understanding that. Yeah. Um, is very alarming and concerning for the future of funding of Oklahoma's public schools. What can public education advocates do to help rescind this agreement, if if any? Um, do you know of any organizations that are doing that sort of work? Yeah, there there are many. I mean, many organizations have have spoken out against this. Uh, the Oklahoma Education Association (OEA), which is the the teachers union for the state, um, has. POE, Professional Oklahoma Educators, which is sort of the more conservative teachers uh, trade organization has, has come out against it. I mean, the Oklahoma State School Board Association, you know, any, any public education advocacy group that you can think of has come out against this. Um, there is almost, there, there will at some point probably be a lawsuit filed against the State Board of Education about this um, to try to rescind the agreement. Um, so, you know, I think what public education, you know, you know, people who care about public education need to call their legislators and uh, ask, you know, hey, what's the legislature um, doing about this? Uh, does the legislature agree with how the State Board of Education sort of changed the way funding works? And, um, yeah, that's that's probably the best way if you if you want to reach out to somebody that your legislator might be the best person. Okay, and has there been any changes in how these charter and virtual schools um, are being held more accountable for transparency with finances at all, or has anything about that portion changed at all since all of this has happened? No, and that was there was legislation introduced about that this session. Um, and it seemed to be targeted at Epic when it was introduced, but uh, it again, it didn't go anywhere. Um, nothing, nothing related to transparency of of education dollars really did much in, during the session. So, okay, uh, and let's go to Senate Bill eight hundred seven. Uh, we had a question from Spencer from OKC. Are there any recent updates relating to how education paraprofessionals are faring with all these changes? Wondering how the jobs of staff, such as aides, tutors, and substitutes might have also seen a huge upheaval. Can you talk about what, what is, what's happening in that Senate bill and what, what do we know about it? Yeah, so Senate Bill 807 uh, is a, a payment protection, like a, a paycheck protection thing, bill, measure, for uh, support staff in schools. Um, and so support staff in schools are like anybody from bus drivers, cafeteria workers, custodians to paraprofessionals, uh, substitutes like was mentioned in the question. Um, right now, those, those uh, employees weren't protected um, and, and many of them, you know, might have lost out on payment during the pandemic when, when schools shut down. A lot of school districts like OKCPS, for example, kept paying uh, their support staff. But this bill would just put it in law that, that these folks need to keep being paid. I mean, overall, as, as far as like the future of, of people in these positions, I mean, it's really hard to say. Uh, it's really hard to, to predict like what public schools are going to be able to do moving forward. Um, their funding uh, is, you know, it's, it's at risk right now. Um, the, the CARES Acts, which, you know, are sort of allocated over time and the American Rescue Plan, um, you know, will we'll, we'll guarantee some money for the coming years, but the long-term outlook is just kind of we we don't know just like we don't know a lot of things about about education it's just kind of 
unpredictable because the money going into it is is unpredictable. Are there any other pieces of legislation within the state legislature that you're, you know, keeping an eye on for maybe a spot here or there on the radio or anything yeah. catching your eye or maybe something that maybe should have been a priority that wasn't this session that you might see at a, in another session? Yeah, I mean, I, it was very surprising, you know, at the beginning of the session, at the beginning of the year, we at State Impact did like oh, what are bills you're going to be watching? And uh, virtual charter school reform was like at the top of the list. So it was pretty surprising seeing none of those go through this session. Um, another one would be uh, House Bill 2074, which is uh, an open transfer bill. Um, it, it basically opens up the window for transfer. Right now, you, you, you have to transfer during a specific time of year if you're gonna change school districts. This would say you can transfer at any point in the year. Um, there would also be uh, school districts would be required to put out how many slots they have open so people know their chances of, of transferring into a district. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of stuff, a lot of what's actually getting passed from what the legislature seems to be interested in doing is related to improving or, or increasing the amount of choice that parents and families have. And um, as, as most people probably know, you know, the, the fear with that is that giving so much choice can, 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 you know, is only going to benefit privileged people already. So um, sort of the underprivileged people going to underfunded schools are just going to keep going to these underfunded schools. Um, and yeah, that's, that's, that's the fear with, with all some of the school choice legislation, but, you know, school choice proponents would say, well, you know, especially charter schools, you know, we take in low income kids, we take in low income families and we try to, to elevate them too. So. Very good. Uh, and so I'm excited for our next portion, um, which is you know, it talks about your trips to go all over the state and everything that you've been taking. Um, what does schooling look like in Oklahoma, you know, from what you've seen? I, so school looks very different. Um, there's masks, first of all, pretty much, you know, though they're not required everywhere. And I did a story at the beginning of the year that there were, you know, a majority of school districts didn't have mask mandates at the beginning of the year, but, but uh, most of them do now. And, and masking is pretty ubiquitous. Um, social distancing, um, there are some efforts being done. Uh, the six foot rule is not, not really being followed I, from what I've seen. Uh, but, um, you know, it's, uh, and, and also there's, there's kids, there's more kids than ever learning from home. I did a story last week, I believe, that, that homeschooling is way up in Oklahoma. It's, it's more than doubled during the pandemic. So um, yeah, it's uh, school, school uh, looks different, but I mean, what, what is familiar, what's totally familiar is um, teachers and, and, and kids who want to come in and, and, and do their best to learn and uh, and uh, educate educate students. I think what's kind of interesting, you know, in what's happening with schooling and like the conversations of like, you know, even with us, with do we go back to work full time? Like, what about this hybrid system? Is that something like uh, school districts are considering, or is it really the hope that you do get back in person full time? Yeah, I mean, there have been some, there have been a few districts that have been slower and have, have experimented with hybrid things. Um, you know, Tulsa has very uh, rather famously been slow to start and in uh, experimenting with this hybrid model. Um, but most school districts are like, let's get in and go full bore in person as much as we can. Um, a really good story by uh, the Frontier I think it was last month showed uh, that that but when schools did that, especially in the fall, they got a lot of transfers to Epic and to other virtual charter schools. Um, people people left 
their traditional district to sort of get away. It's really, we have no idea if they liked it. We have no idea if they're coming back. We just, we just don't know. I mean, we're missing, there are kids who have just gone missing, who have just like, the education system has no idea where they are, where they're going to school. They're probably not going to school. Um, so uh, yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of work to, there's a lot of catch up work to do. Um, but hopefully, hopefully next year things look a little bit more normal. Yeah, it sounds like something you're going to be keeping a close eye on. Yeah, for uh, sure. Seeing, seeing if those trends continue or not. Um, so I want to take a moment and talk about just like the behind the scenes of getting on national. You had a story uh, that you did with WBUR's Carrie Young. Um, it was a it was a piece that we didn't really know what it was like. It was called a pinwheel. And I remember everybody was like, what is that? Um, yeah. Can you yeah. explain to people on this call, like, how does one even get onto national NPR and give us some insight into how that actually works? Yeah, I'll, t I'll sort of tell you all this story of this, this pinwheel story. And, and so basically what a pinwheel story is, is it starts with a host. And in this case, it was Elsa Chang. Uh, sort of saying like something general and then we're going to go pinwheel around the country and uh you know see how things look and, and the story we did was about in-person schooling so as as background i take part in these weekly npr uh education member station reporter calls and so there are a lot of education reporters from around the country um state impact oklahoma is really and, and KOSU too, really fortunate that, that we get to participate in these national calls. We're usually the only, I'm usually the only person who lives in a red state participating in them, um, other than maybe the occasional Floridian. Uh, so um, I do this weekly call and we were just sort of talking about last fall, late last fall about what school looked like. And I was like, well, you know, everybody's back in person in Oklahoma and they just couldn't, they just couldn't believe it. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they couldn't believe the stories I was, I was telling. Um, so Carrie Young actually pitched to Nicole Cohen, who is the, the education editor there, um, a story where we sort of compared and contrasted a district, a very wealthy district in Massachusetts, uh, Wellesley, and they, said they wanted to compare a district here in Oklahoma. Um, I just happened to know the superintendent of El Reno Public Schools, we have a relationship. And so we sort of compared and contrasted uh, the Wellesley, Massachusetts Public Schools response to COVID and the El Reno Public Schools response to COVID. Um, I toured El Reno High School and, and an elementary school there. Um, the thing that, that I think was really surprising and, and we and we wrote our scripts together and all that but what was really surprising to me was the the links that that they went to in wellesley they did these sort of hybrid um schedules uh they had they did weekly monitoring of testing of of students they had qr codes on the lunchroom tables to like aid with contact tracing um, all these different sort of interesting things. And none of, none of that was going on in El Reno. But uh, honestly, the results were, uh, the results were, were nearly the same. Um, so both schools had had to close down for, for cases twice over the course of the fall semester. So that was really interesting to see. And, and now we're seeing a huge push nationwide to get back to school in person um, and, and most, most children in America now have that option. Um, and, and pretty much every kid in Oklahoma has that option now too. So I want to go back to like what you said, where you're like, usually the only education reporter from a red state on this call. Like what were some of the, I know it ended up being with, you know, a story with you and uh, Carrie, but what's so, sort of the things that you're hearing that are just like completely different from what's happening here from the other education reporters. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the issues here are a lot different. They're a lot different, but they're also the same. I mean, uh, for example, Massachusetts 
Massachusetts like state funding um, per student, for example, is over $20,000. In Oklahoma, it's a little bit less than $9,000 per student that we put into, into schools from the state. So, I mean, when you have those kinds of disparities in spending, you know, things are gonna be different. Um, they're starting to see the trends that we're seeing here on, on various scales in other states. For example, the teacher shortage that we've had here for several years, um, and, and we've seen a dramatic increase in emergency certified teachers, basically teachers who um, are approved to, to go into the classroom on a temporary basis, um, even if they haven't quite met all of the qualifications. Um, we're starting to see more of those around the country. Um, so I think Oklahoma has kind of positioned itself as a, um, a canary in a coal mine on uh, you know, what happens when, when you stop, when you're not funding education as well, when you're not funding higher education as well, especially, um, yeah, you sort of start to have these issues like a massive teacher shortage which now we're starting to see nationally and we've seen in Oklahoma for a very long time. Very good. Um, I just wanna remind everybody that we are on our last bit uh, for doing some questions and answers with Robbie. So if you have any, any questions from what you've learned today, go ahead and submit and we'll try to answer those. Um, Robbie, before we get to that, if, if any questions come in, um, you talked you touched on the legislation that you're kind of keeping an eye out for, but what are some like maybe feature pieces or other story leads or anything that you're keeping an eye on or a year or two, I guess? Yeah. So uh, uh, you know, I'm I will be producing this week's state impact feature on Thursdays for for those of you who don't know, state impact does a feature on every NPR member station in Oklahoma. Um, that's about four minutes. And I, so I am doing this week's and it is about uh, that, that decision by the state board that we mentioned earlier. I actually interviewed um, the president of the Oklahoma Public Charter School Association about sort of why they filed this lawsuit, why charter, like why charter schools are, are wanting more money and 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 what are the you know what does he see as as the potential ramifications of that? Um, so that'll come out this week. Uh, I'm going to uh, Positive Tomorrows, which is a school here in Oklahoma City specifically catered toward homeless children. Um, I'm going to have a a I'm I'm visiting there very soon. I'm going to have sort of a feature on how are they how are they weathering the pandemic? What sort of lessons have they learned, and and um, you know what what kind of lessons we can take from there that that might be able to translate from dealing with pandemic trauma uh, in in schools more broadly. And then uh, you know uh, finally another story I'm working on uh, is about my long hair that you might notice here. I haven't gotten it cut in over a year. Um, I'm actually working on a story about uh, sort of what is it like to go to um, ha a hairstyle school uh, to become a, a stylist or a barber uh, during a pandemic. And um, I'm actually going to go get my hair cut by a, uh, a recent graduate. And we're just going to have a, a conversation about that. And, um, talk to some folks in the in the hairstyling world about um, you know why you know how many people are there like me out there am I an anomaly are are many of us putting barbers out of business uh, you know why did people want to get into bar cutting hair right now you know it's a difficult time so yeah it seems like that would be an industry that might suffer a little bit since yeah it's so yeah. personal um, yeah and it, it definitely has um so it should be interesting to see talk to some young folks who uh are, are pursuing that right now now i did have to ask because i did get a question from my cousin when i told her she's a senior uh norman uh when i told her that <laughs> 
uh, we were doing this. She wanted to know, have you heard anything about prom? Is, is prom <laughs> going on normal? I, I, I think that's probably a school by school basis. I mean, as you saw last year, proms were mostly canceled. Uh, but, you know, we were able to see a lot of graduations go through. Um, you know, that's the hard part of going to high school this year um, and as well as last year. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, schools and, and well, mainly their students have found ways to get creative about, about doing these kinds of things. Like we saw drive-in, we saw graduations at, at drive-in movie theaters and stuff like that. So, um, you know, what I would say to your cousin is uh, he or she needs to get creative and, uh, um, you know, get to organizing the prom because it's mostly student driven, so. Well, very good. Um, I don't see any other questions that came in through it, but uh, you know, Robbie and I are always happy to answer questions that come into our email. So Robbie's email is Robbie at stateimpactoklahoma.org. Mine is Kately at kosu.org. Uh, thank you very much for joining. I'll pass it back to Myriad, um, but we appreciate, appreciate yeah, you, Robbie, for you. coming on. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Of course. Thank you so much to everybody who attended tonight's uh, edition of Inside KOSU. Um, we'll be sending out a follow-up email with links um, and resources for you to check out um, at your convenience, stuff that we talked about into tonight's event. Um, just a reminder, this event is made possible because of your support. Uh, KOSU would not exist without our members. Um, you guys literally put the public in public radio. So thank you for making this event happen and have a good night to everybody. See you later.